Kenneth Davis, Big Ten Country with us. And uh, Kenneth, first of all, on college football, um, I am thoroughly enjoying every part of this season as a as a broadcaster, as a podcaster, or whatever you want to call it. Now, as a fan of Florida State, I've already, you know, uh, booked several therapy appointments for when the season's over. But, well, I mean, that's for later when I can completely unpack my pain. Uh, but as a college football fan, it's been unbelievable and – we're at a point here in the season where I have no idea what's going to happen. Like, I, you can't mm -hmm. predict it. I have no idea what's going to happen. I think I know the teams are going to be there at the end. But we've seen enough from even the, the elite teams where everybody's vulnerable. Everyone has a whole um, – and now it's funny because going off our last conversation last week, and I told you that the old curmudgeon man that likes powerhouses, you have to come to grips with what the reality of what we're going through right now. And it's cool. I don't like the fact that, as you just pointed out, I'm not sure as I usually am when it comes to these predictions and these teams, but some of it, and you, you look at, for instance, like Illinois, some of it you feel good about because there are teams that are near and dear to you. And it's great to see them kind of have, the success in this environment of parity to go along with having more open playoff slots. Um, but then, like, and I know we'll talk about it later, you got, you know, what happened with SC. Um, we had where at one point we thought, you know, we knew Michigan was still trying to be something, but we we see that there's still going to be some growing pains with the, 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 the beating they took from U of I. They took it. It was a buking more than a beating because when you got some trickeration in there, it's not a, a clear – beating beating um but then you look at the fact that um it's just been a lot of look at uh, uh nebraska like and i think i'll say this too when as far as nebraska and i know we'll dive into that a lot of the times when we've been on here talking i try to preference everything everything with saying that these teams are early in their rebuilding process particularly nebraska and even sc and you kind of saw that with nebraska but also in it's still just my disrespect, and I think the country's disrespect for the University of Indiana and the respect that has to be applied to them. And I, I know I haven't put enough respect when it comes to the Hoosiers. So it's just one of those things with parity and now with the wide open playoffs that we just have to come to grips with. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Let's dive into Nebraska first then. Uh, they've got Ohio State this week. Indiana absolutely threw them in a wood chipper last week, and it was not pretty. It was not pretty. I thought that game was going to be really good. I thought this mm -hmm. is two teams on the up, and I still think Nebraska's on the up, but they caught an Indiana team that is just so confident and uh, has such a fantastic offense that it they got once they got fully behind the eight ball, they just could not escape it. This week is Ohio State. I didn't expect them to win that game, but can they play better? I mean, can they – have a better showing than that against Indiana. I know Ohio State's widely more talented, at least, but I just don't see another fifty-six to seven coming for this team. I, maybe I have too much faith in Matt Rule, but I, I I just don't see that coming again another week. Will they win? Probably not. But can mm -hmm. they look better? I don't think they're going to get their asses beat. Is I think yeah. it's the question to that degree. But the, I think the thing will be this, and it still can be like this. Contextually, what will it be? Because after getting beat 56-7, to seven, you know, one, you got to batten down the hatches with the run game. Uh, we, we think about everything that Curtis Rourke and, and Tevin Jack Jackson did through the air. But really, you got to look at how they were ran on, speaking of Nebraska's defense. And we've talked a lot at nauseum about Chip Kelly and the physicality that he's bringing with Ohio State's run defense run offense and i expect to see that a lot and it could be a situation where they're getting beat as bad but the score may not be as lopsided particularly if if dylan riola can can score and not turn the ball over as much through the air he had over 200 yards passing but still you know it didn't score any touchdowns i think he had like three turnovers if if he can even just be vanilla but not turn the ball over it's going to uh, allow nebraska as far as the, the Lopsided score probably not to, to vary as, as, as crazy as it did versus Indiana, but they're definitely not going to win versus Ohio State. Like, 
I think that the real question is, and we've said here and we've talked at it a lot, is when Indiana faces Ohio State. But when it comes back to Nebraska, um, I just think now when we've said it that Matt Rule's in year two. And like it, it's 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 okay, you know, because now and we know that he's building it through the high schools. There are gonna be some things you just can't get from those kids up there. You know, like you're there's some things that you're gonna need the transfer portal and NIL to do when it comes to certain athletic attributes. And I know a lot of times when I'm saying that we're thinking about skill positions, but I'm not even saying that it could be edge rushers, you know, it, it's 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 different things that you're gonna have to, but they're they're in year two. At a, a heralded school in Nebraska with the head coach that is a proven program builder slash or rebuilder. So I'm not I'm not scared. And they still have a young quarterback that has the potential to be perhaps generational, but I, I'm not saying he is. We have to see it next season. But we still know there's a ton of talent in Dylan Riola. So I wouldn't I wouldn't be scared or crazy right now or act crazy if I was Nebraska. I just think so. Sometimes where you start off the season and things are going so well, and then you have that loss to Illinois, and you look at how well Illinois has played, so the loss doesn't sting as bad as it stung. But you you start off the year and you're thinking the sky is the limit, and then you kind of got to get pushed back on your bridges and kind of learn where you're at. So then next season you can know where necessarily you need to be going. Yeah, absolutely. Um I want to finish with Illinois and Oregon because that, to me, is the the most intriguing game of the week. This is not, like, a a great week in the Big Ten, like, as far as that, but that means we're probably going to see something wild. Like, this would be the week that Nebraska may do that because that's tracked, you know, earlier in the year. But Penn State and Wisconsin is an interesting one to me. Penn State uh, continually looks um, better and better to me. Uh, And this is – this is the James Franklin team I have the most faith in. Wisconsin is is year two now under Luke Fickle. Um, they obviously need better quarterback play, but they're not as bad as I thought they would be w- at that position. They're okay. I mean, Tyler Van Dyke was never going to be something I thought that helped them. Then when he got hurt, it, it kind of opened the door for them a little bit, I think, to, to see what they really had. Um, is this a game, though, that Penn State could could kind of flex their muscles offensively and and let the dogs hunt? Oh, that's a good question. No, because oh. I'll say this. One, and this is Drew Aller fan club, head yeah. of the fan club. We saw two weeks ago versus SC. You think about them going trailing 20 to 6. And even with one interception, Drew Aller threw a couple more, but you saw him grow with the ball in his hands. And of course, how well Tyler Warren can play. The thing I think, though, you have to remember is you're talking about a top 10 defensive backfield in college when you're talking about Wisconsin. And Wisconsin can fly around. The problem that Wisconsin faces is when you're looking at the two-headed monster that when with with, with, with Singleton and uh, Trayvon, I, I don't want to butcher his name as I'm, I'm skipping out, and I always end Allen with Allen. Mm-hmm. When you look at the fact that Wisconsin is ranked 62nd when you're talking about stopping the run, I think you're going to get into a situation perhaps now through the air. It's going to be through play action and also the versatility of Ty Ty Warren where they'll take care of it through the air. But I think they're going to try to exploit the run game versus Wisconsin, particularly because even with James James Franklin, this hasn't been one of the the best traveling teams when you're talking about Penn State. I think hopefully, I want to say I think hopefully this year, is a growth there where with the talent that they have there, we can see that they can travel and get it done. But you start, you start to want to see, and I think kind of what you're saying when you're saying, let the dogs hunt, you want to see them travel and dominate. I don't know if they're going to dominate Wisconsin with how well their defensive backfields play the plays. So that would kind of be the question for me when we're talking about uh, Wisconsin and what, if you can expect with Hunter Warler and also Ricardo uh, Hallman in the defensive backfield for Wisconsin, they got some dogs back there in the backfield that are great Big Ten defensive backs. So I don't know if Drew Allen is going to be able to just weaponize uh, his, his receiving core, even though I'm sure that Ty Warren is going to uh, perform pretty well. Indiana takes on Washington uh, this week. Uh, they're uh, they're not going to have Curtis Rourke, so I assume a little bit of a dip, but. Um, the, the backup has experience. He started five games a year ago. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is a team that's playing really confident. Washington's very much a transitional team right now. Will Rogers has put up some numbers, but um, is this another one where Indiana can can maybe be comfortable, or is Washington just given the fact that 
Jed Fish has done a great job of, of rebuilding that team even to this point where they lost. I mean, they literally lost everything off a national championship uh, caliber roster last year. Lost it all, but has he, like, you know, wrapped it, maybe at least contained the the spill, so to speak? I don't think this is a Jed Fisher thing, um, to be honest with you. I think this has a, a lot, a lot more to do with what's going on in Indiana. I yeah. personally, Paul, I'm not, not – I'm not until we talk about Indiana, Ohio State. I'm not picking anybody to be Indiana. All right. So I'm throwing that gauntlet down. I don't think it's a gauntlet of what Indiana's been able to do. Um, you just pointed it out. I think Washington is in transition. It'll be interesting because Jeff Fisher seems like he can be a guy that can take over that program. I've said it on here plenty of times. That program has a really successful floor through transition. Like it's not a situation where they're lost. To- in the wilderness when they go from one head coach running the program to another. Usually it may take a couple seasons, and then when they're they're one of the pretty good teams within college football, I expect to see that within the, next, the coming seasons. But right now, this year, I don't think it's a chance. Even with, with Tavian Jackson, and you pointed out he started five games last year and taking over for Curtis Work, injured with the thumb, who may, who's probably looked at as going to be returning this season. I, I mean – it was 200. Even when you look at the yards, it's Taven Jackson did a pretty good job last last weekend taking over in the second half. 280 through the air, 215 through the rushing. I don't see them being able to pull it off defensively. Two sacks, seven tackles for loss, and three INTs. We're not just talking about a team that's doing it on the offensive side because one of the things, even getting back to that Nebraska we think that their, their wide receiver core probably has to get better in the future, but we think they have a gifted running back. But we've seen the fact that regardless of who's in the backfield and Dowell has been a, a rugged running back, they have a really good offensive line at times, and we can see that they can get the get it done. And we didn't see any of that versus the Hoosiers. And nobody can tell me you came into this this season thinking that the Hoosiers were going to be a defensive juggernaut or at any way whatsoever. So, no, I'm taking the Hoosiers over the Hus- Huskies. Um, I apologize to the state of Indiana. I have not put enough respect on your name. Here <laughs> goes your respect. It, it, no, it's not even, it's not, it has nothing to do with Washington. This right now, and we we talked about it with what Matt Rule said prior to last week, per last week's show and last week's game. If they didn't start out, out of the top 25, they would be within the top 10. So this is one of the best schools it, it, this year within the Big Ten. We still have to see them play the top, top, and we they, they don't have that many opportunities to play the top elite. But if you're just looking at it as far as who's on your schedule, they are wrecking shop when we're talking about the, the teams that they're facing on their schedule. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So um, before we get to the good game, this the, the best game of the week, Illinois and Oregon, uh, USC is a fraud. Right, yeah. like they're they're a fraud, uh, and uh, unfortunate for them. But um, like this is, should we have maybe known this was coming a little bit? Like, did we did we put too much in that LSU that LSU win? Because the teams are pointed in opposite directions after that. Yeah, I mean, when you look at that's the only. Lo- I think at the beginning of the season after LSU took that loss, we thought that LSU was going to have one of those LSU years where it's like, man, you got a lot. Of- the talent but you guys got like three losses or maybe two losses and you should have won three i mean should have lost three and now you look at that being the only loss that they've suffered this season um i think the problem and i hate i hate you know going at anybody you know and i'm not calling for anybody's job or whatever but when you look at the fact of a 14 point switch around as far as how they came back versus sc last week um and you think about Lincoln Riley's supposed to be an offensive mastermind. Because a lot of times, if you just look at the score and you're like, okay, they lost by a point, and they both teams almost scored 30 points, you look at it as, well, I can't put that on the offense, right? But when, you, when you're when you talking about you were up by 14 and you weren't able to score another touchdown, I know Miller Moss threw uh, an interception to start off the second half, and then, of course, the defense lied down. I, I think we've given a lot of props to DeAnton Lynn, and I'm not trying to take it away, but it's still early, and there's only so much you can do trying to flip over that defensive roster this year with him coming over from UCLA. Um, But, yeah, I can't say – if we're going off of what we were saying at the beginning of the year, and I'll apply this to myself, yes, it's fraudulent compared to what you thought they would be able to do within the Big Ten. And even that loss against Michigan, you thought that was more of a temperature check for SC. And now it's proven that it's more of the standard 
Um, Lincoln Riley offensively isn't necessarily getting it done in these games, particularly where we were looking at these Pac-12 Pac schools are coming over, that the fear was we're not going to be able to start traditional Big Ten schools. We're not going to be able to score 30 points consistent, consistently with them. But even when, you, when I'm saying that, those teams are supposed to still, if it's, it, it becomes a quote-unquote shootout, supposed to be able to put up the points at the end to solidify the game and you didn't see that so on both sides of the ball the side that the head coach Leak and Riley is formidable with and then you look at what Lynn is doing they've there's been failure um I'll be interested to see and it's funny just even thinking about this I know Lincoln Riley and how people have always kind of skeptical about him the last couple of weeks I've been thinking about this is a great opportunity for Lynn to grow and even if there's times where in the let's just say the next season or two if he remains the defensive coordinator um that it, it'd be a great opportunity for him to really get his name out there if his defense can still perform solidly and consistently compared to the vacillations that could be happening on the offense and also when i'm saying that they're still putting up nice points as far as on the offensive side but sometimes you just have to be able to punch the ball through when your team needs it towards the end of the game and they weren't able to do that and that falls on Lincoln Riley because that's his side of the ball yeah, absolutely. All right, let's wind up with Illinois and Oregon. Uh, Illinois is going to take a chunk out of whoever they play. I mean, that's their kind of style. Mm -hmm. But Oregon, um, they are hitting on all cylinders finally. And Dan Lanning has come into his own. It's it's like he's it's like he's like got the you know the fifth Infinity Stone or whatever. Like he's mm -hmm. he's he's kind of there now after that Ohio State win. I mean, he looked. I mean, he looked literally ravenous on the sidelines, like he was. He had. He had just taken down a, a wildebeest. Seriously. So, um, does Illinois? Can Illinois keep them in the box, or is this one where we maybe have to go? Listen, good. Good work, Illinois. But Oregon might be the. the they might be the class of the country right now. You just answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah. Again, I think that the question will – I think what we're looking to see, and it's not a knock on Illinois, it's just the facts when you're talking about a supremely talented team, one of the up-and-coming better coaches when we're talking about college football and Dan Lanning. Um, and also even last week where, you know, you look at the score 21-7 to versus Michigan and it was at home, you still need a trickeration on the, the, the field goal to, 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 to get able to get to almost uh, scoring a touchdown with the tight end and then punching it in to score another TD. So you can kind of say, you know, it was 14-7. to So you're talking about an Oregon team that we know – can run up the score on you. Uh, we've seen that they can be a team that can lean on the run. Going back to the beginning of the season when we were complaining about Dylan Gabriel and them leaning on the pass with uh, too many attempts. Um, so I, I don't see Illinois being able to pull it off. Illinois, again, stout defensively. Uh, speaking of Wisconsin, another team with a nice defensive backfield. But this is too much when you're going up against Oregon. And I, I think it, it still can be good for perhaps, depending on who falls, who may fall within the top 12 to help Illinois if they have a good game. Because if you look at the biggest games they're going to basically play this year outside, because Michigan is in Michigan. So that's going to take a hit. Penn State, contextually, you could say where it didn't look as bad as only scoring seven points um, because it's not like Penn State put it on you as you would expect it with the weapons that Penn State has on offense. But when you look at the point that Penn State had 20-something points and you had seven, and you look at the fact that Oregon may is probably going to have double-digit points on you too, you want to kind of start setting your resume up so when it gets down to the playoff times that these schools, these that the, the, that the judges can at least – look at it and say, okay, even when you played said Oregon, you really gave this, this school that we view as being perhaps the best school in the country a run for its money. I don't know if Illinois will be able to do it, but it would go a long way in helping them try perhaps to get into the playoffs because they're still on the outside looking in. Um, but it would be a great story here locally if Illinois was able to pull it off in a season where if they had seven wins, people probably would have been pretty happy here, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and so for them to even play the way that they played this year, you know, getting the six. And I'm saying that because I expect them to at least get eight victories. Um, it's been a terrific year. But, man, Oregon, as you pointed out, they're, they are – uh, they they're they're kicking it in at the right time of the season and like the, but a, a couple weeks ago talking to you there was a fear was could Oregon turn it up or were they priming and it was like is, are they really priming or is this just one of those years where you know they're going to be good but 
not as good as we expected. And as of right now, it, it definitely looks like they're priming. So I just think that there's a chance Illinois could be more than a speed bump, but may end up being somewhat of a speed bump versus the, the Badgers. Kenneth Davis, Big Ten Country. Look him up. Make sure you watch his podcast, too. Uh, always appreciate our time with Kenneth. Kenneth, enjoy your weekend, and good luck to Alabama versus the very disappointing Missouri team. Hold on, before we go, we talked about a young quarterback at Syracuse last week. Oh, and- my God. Oh, <laughs> oh poor Kyle. Poor, poor Kyle. Kyle. I just wanted to point that out. Oh, We're- poor Kyle. Oh, and I was saying how, as being a, a Big Ten watcher, there were questions with all. Ohio State when he was there, and there was a tip that was one of the offensive players, but there are a lot of tips where he was throwing at the defender's hands. So, Cal McCord, woo, again, <sighs> yeah. that was, man, hey, man. Here's, the, here's the good news for Kyle. You can't play any worse than that. <laughs> You're right. You're right. It's on You're the right. way up. Oh, my God. That was, you know, I mean, he threw three touchdown passes, just not to the right team. So exactly. I'm a silver lining guy, Kenneth. That's what I, <laughs> oh, poor, oh, oh, poor Kyle. Watching that game last night, you know, I saw the first one. Then my wife and I, we started watching the Red Sox thing on, on Netflix. Cause I'm a huge Red Sox guy mm-hmm. and it's, it's fantastic. Okay. Although I will tell you as a Red Sox fan, the first episode is all 2003. And I was like back Ooh. there melting down mentally again, just reliving it. And yes. like the, pit of my stomach um but uh but then i like checked i was like oh it can't be oh my god it's 31 nothing and a half and pitts had the ball for four minutes you know like, that is awful that is special kind of awful so yeah ridiculous well kenneth enjoy the weekend we'll talk to you next friday all right there's kenneth davis a great one. Kenneth Davis, Big Ten Country, here with us on 365 Sports. We're wrapping it up, talking Big 12 with Josh Neighbors next.